Hi everyone, this video is the first in a two-part series on this book, The Problem of Evil by Peter Van Wagen. Van Wagen is a prominent Christian philosopher who is well known for his work on The Problem of Evil. I read this book for the first time in college, and it turned out to be one of my favorites. I'm really excited to share the content of it with you today. So this is going to be a very high-level overview of the work. I won't be able to get into all the details and nuance of his arguments, but I hope that by the time you're done with this video, you'll have a very general understanding of how Van Wagen responds to the argument from evil, and how you can as well. So let's get started. So let's start by looking at some definitions. So Van Wagen defines evil as bad things. So the problem of evil is the problem that the existence of bad things poses for theists. Theists just meaning people who believe in God. And what does Van Wagen mean by God? He has a whole chapter in which he discusses the idea of God in extensive detail, but for the purposes of thinking about the problem of evil, the three most important attributes of God are his omnipotence, omniscience, and moral perfection. And in this book, when Van Wagen is discussing the problem of evil, he is completely focused on the apologetic problem of evil, which is how to respond to the argument from evil. So he seeks to show that the argument from evil is a failure. So now that we've defined Van Wagen's key terms, let's look at a specific version of the argument from evil. The first argument that Van Wagen considers is called the global argument from evil. The world contains vast amounts of horrendous evil. If God existed, the world would not contain vast amounts of horrendous evil. Therefore, God does not exist. Premise 2 is going to be the one that Van Wagen challenges in this book. And he does that by constructing what he calls a defense. So what is a defense? A defense is a story. It's not claimed to be true, but claimed to be a very real possibility, such that if it's true, it provides justifying reasons for certain actions. So let's look at this highly sophisticated graphic. So think of the person on the left as the prosecuting attorney, and the one on the right as the defense attorney. So the prosecuting attorney says, X is guilty because he did Y. And the defense attorney responds by saying, that conclusion isn't justified. Here's a good reason that X might have had for doing Y. So let's think of an example. This is one that Van Wagen gives, and I'm going to quote him several times throughout this. So suppose you have a friend, Carissa, who is a single mother, and she left two very young children in her apartment alone overnight. Now your Aunt Harriet, a woman of strong moral principles, finds out about this and proclaims that Carissa is unfit to raise children. At this point, you rush to Carissa's defense and tell your Aunt Harriet, Now, Aunt Harriet, don't go jumping to conclusions. There's probably a perfectly good explanation. Maybe Billy or Annie was ill, and she decided to go over to the clinic for help. You know she hasn't got a phone or a car, and no one in that neighborhood of hers would come to the door at 2 o'clock in the morning. Notice, you aren't claiming to know what Carissa's reasons for leaving the children alone are. You are merely trying to show that your aunt's proclamation isn't justified by the facts. And you do this by giving a story, a narrative, that is true for all anyone knows, a very real possibility, such that we have no reason to think it's false. Now notice, this type of answer has limits. You can't use it to make up anything you want. For instance, let's say you tried to answer your aunt by saying that aliens temporarily abducted Carissa and then brought her back after several hours after wiping her memories of the whole thing. Now this is a possibility, technically, but it's so distant and remote that we can't take it seriously. So Van Wagen wants to give a defense to the problem of evil, and he says there's only one that has any hope of succeeding, and that's the free will defense. So if you could simplify Van Wagen's free will defense into a formula, it would look like this. Free will is required for love, which is required for union with God. So Van Wagen constructs a defense, a narrative that seeks to show that it's a very real possibility that God had to allow free will and risk an enormous amount of evil to achieve the good of uniting free creatures to himself. So this defense is going to call into question the second premise of the global argument from evil. If God existed, the world would not contain vast amounts of horrendous evil. Keep in mind, this premise is only true 
if God doesn't have good reasons for allowing vast amounts of evil. And the free will defense is how Vanna Wagon is going to provide these reasons. So we'll get into the actual narrative of the defense in a minute, but first, let's dig into what Vanna Wagon means by free will. So Vanna Wagen claims that free will is required for love and requires alternate possibilities. To quote him, if I have a free choice between X and Y, even God cannot ensure that I choose X. Keep in mind, Vanna Wagen isn't saying it's impossible that God can make someone choose X over Y. Of course God could do that. What Vanna Wagen is saying is that God couldn't make someone choose X over Y freely. Because that's a contradiction. That's like saying God could create a square circle. So for people to have free will, whatever it is that is required for love, reality has to look like this. At points in the timeline, there have to be branching paths of alternate possibilities for our choices. To understand this idea better, let's contrast free will with another idea called determinism. So determinism is the thesis that the past and laws of nature together determine a unique future. Whatever happens is determined, if, given what came before, it could not, not happen. If determinism is true, reality looks kind of like this. What happens at every point on the timeline is necessitated by the laws of nature and what came before it. If determinism is true, there are no alternate possibilities for our actions or for anything else. Vanna Wagen claims that if determinism is true for all reality, then we aren't capable of love. The two are incompatible. So this is relevant to the free will defense because Vanna Wagen claims that it's a very real possibility that to allow people to love him, God had to risk evil by permitting alternate possibilities. Now notice, if Vanna Wagen is wrong and determinism is compatible with the ability to love, then God doesn't need to allow alternate possibilities to get people to love him, and then the free will defense fails. Why? Because God could simply determine he could make it inevitable that everyone freely chooses to love him. That's what we'll get into on the next slide. So are free will and determinism compatible? Van and Wagen calls this the no barriers theory. Free will only requires an agent to be able to act on his desires. If this is true, God could determine everyone to freely choose to love him and avoid any possibility of evil entering the world. Because remember, the free will defense requires that God allow people alternate possibilities. But if this view of free will is true, no alternate possibilities are required. Thus, the free will defense fails. As a counterexample to this theory, Van Wagen asks us to consider Huxley's novel, A Brave New World. Now, if you remember, there is a very rigid caste society in Brave New World, and at the bottom are the workers called the Epsilons. And the Epsilons have been conditioned since before birth to have only the desires that those at the top of the hierarchy, the Alphas, choose for them. So, Manowagon asks us, do the Epsilons have free will? Most people intuitively would say, no, if you've been conditioned your entire life to have only the desires that someone else chose for you, and you can't have any others, that doesn't seem like you have free will. However, according to the no barriers theory of free will, the Epsilons do have it because all they ever do is act on their desires. Now, Vanna Wacken doesn't claim that he's proved this theory wrong. He only says this brave new world example is a serious objection to it. Keep in mind, he isn't trying to prove anything about free will. He's merely trying to demonstrate that it's a very real possibility that it's incompatible with determinism. So I'm going to read an extended quote from his free will defense narrative. And keep in mind, in this book, Van Wagen is not claiming this narrative is true. He is claiming that it's a very real possibility, we have no reason to think it's false, and that if it's true, it provides justifying reasons for why God would allow so much evil in the world. Also keep in mind the formula that we talked about several slides ago. Free will is necessary for love, which is necessary for union with God. Let's get started. For millions of years, perhaps for thousands of millions of years, God guided the course of evolution so as eventually to produce certain very clever primates, the immediate predecessors of Homo sapiens. At some time in the past few thousand years, the human ancestors formed a small breeding community, a few thousand, or a few hundred, or even a few score. 
That is to say, there was a time when every ancestor of modern human beings who was then alive was a member of this tiny, geographically tight-knit group of primates. In the fullness of time, God took members of this breeding group and miraculously raised them to rationality. That is, he gave them the gifts of language, abstract thought, and disinterested love, and, of course, the gift of free will. Perhaps we cannot understand all his reasons for giving human beings free will, but here is one very important one we can understand. He gave them the gift of free will because free will is necessary for love. Love, and not only erotic love, implies free will. The essential connection between love and free will is beautifully illustrated in Ruth's declaration to her mother-in-law, Naomi. And Ruth said, And treat me not to leave thee, or to return from following after thee. For whither thou goest, I will go, and where thou lodgest, I will lodge. Thy people will be, shall be my people, and thy God my God. Where thou diest, I will die, and there will I be buried. The Lord do so to me, and more also, if aught but death part thee and me. God not only raised these primates to rationality, not only made them what we call human beings, but also took them into a kind of mystical union with himself, the sort of union that Christians hope for in heaven and call the beatific vision. Being in union with God, these new human beings, these primates who had become human beings at a certain point in their lives, lived together in the harmony of perfect love and also possessed what theologians used to call preternatural powers, something like what people who believe in them today called paranormal abilities. Because they lived in the harmony of perfect love, none of them did any harm to the others. Because of their preternatural powers, they were able somehow to protect themselves from wild beasts, which they were able to tame with a look, from disease which they were able to cure with a touch, and from random destructive natural events, like earthquakes, which they knew about in advance and were able to escape. There was thus no evil in their world, and it was God's intention that they should never become decrepit with age and die as their primate forebears had. But somehow, in some way that must be mysterious to us, they were not content with this paradisaical state. They abused the gift of free will and separated themselves from their union with God. The result was horrific. Not only did they no longer enjoy the beatific vision, but they now faced destruction by random forces of nature and were subject to old age and natural death. Nevertheless, they were too proud to end their rebellion. As the generations passed, they drifted farther and farther from God into worship of false gods, a worship that sometimes involved human sacrifice, inner tribal warfare, complete with gleeful torture of prisoners of war, private murder, slavery, and rape. On one level, they realized, or some of them realized, that something was horribly wrong, but they were unable to do anything about it. After they had separated themselves from God, they were, as an engineer might say, not operating under design conditions. A certain frame of mind had become dominant among them, a frame of mind latent in the genes they had inherited from a million or more generations of ancestors. I mean the frame of mind that places one's own desires and perceived welfare above everything else, and which accords to the status of one's immediate relatives a subordinate privileged status, and assigns no status at all to the welfare of anyone else. And this frame of mind was now married to rationality, to the power of abstract thought. The progeny of this marriage were continuing resentment against those whose actions interfere with the fulfillment of one's desires, hatreds cherished in the heart, and the desire for revenge. The inherited genes that produced these baleful effects had been harmless as long as human beings still had, constantly before their minds, a reputation of perfect love and the beatific vision. In this state of separation from God and conjoined with rationality, they formed the genetic substrate of what is called original or birth sin, an inborn tendency to do evil against which all human efforts are vain. We, or most of us, have some sort of perception of the distinction between good and evil, but however we struggle, in the end we give in and do evil. In all cultures there are moral codes, more similar than some would have us believe, and the members of every tribe and nation stand condemned not only by alien moral codes, but by their own. 
that only human beings who consistently do right in their own eyes, whose consciences are always clear, are those who, like the Nazis, have given themselves over entirely to evil. Those who say, in some twisted and self-deceptive way, what Milton has his Satan say explicitly and clearly, Evil, be thou my good. When human beings had become like this, God looked out over a ruined world. And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Genesis 6 verse 5. It would have been just of him to leave human beings in the ruin that they had made of themselves and their world. But God is more than a God of justice. He is, indeed, more than a God of mercy. A God who was merely merciful might simply have brought the story of humanity to an end at the, that point, like a man who shoots a horse with a broken leg. But God is more than a God of mercy. He is a God of love. He, therefore, neither left our species to its own devices, nor mercifully destroyed it. Rather, he set in motion a rescue operation. He put into operation a plan designed to restore separated humanity to union with himself. This defense will not specify the nature of this plan of atonement. The three Abrahamic religions, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, tell three different stories about the nature of this plan, and I do not propose to favor one of them over another in telling a story that, after all, I do not maintain is true. This much must be said, however. The plan has the following feature, and any plan with the object of restoring separated humanity to union with God would have to have this feature. Its object is to bring it about that human beings once more love God. And since love essentially involves free will, love is not something that can be imposed from the outside by an act, by an act of sheer power. Human beings must choose freely to be reunited with God and to love him. And this is something they are unable to do by their own efforts. They must, therefore, cooperate with God. And as is the case with many rescue operations, the rescuer and those whom he is rescuing must cooperate. For human beings to cooperate with God in this rescue operation, they must know that they need to be rescued. They must know what it means to be separated from him. And what it means to be separated from God is to live in a world of horrors. If God simply canceled all the horrors of this world by an endless series of miracles, he would thereby frustrate his own plan of reconciliation. If he did that, we should be content with our lot and see no reason to cooperate with him. So notice, in this narrative, Van and Wagen addresses what is called natural evil. Earthquakes, tornadoes, disease, animal attacks, and any other feature of the natural world that is harmful to humans in some way. In his defense, he says that pre-fall, because of our union with God, humans could avoid or counteract all the negative effects of natural evil. However, as a result of the fall and our separation from God, we lost this ability and became subject to all kinds of natural evil. So for Van and Wagen, natural evil is the result of humanity abusing the gift of free will. And God didn't restore our ability to protect ourselves from nature. Because that would be like giving pain pills to a sick person that desperately needs to stop smoking and lose weight. Humanity needed to realize how bad the world was without God and see the need to turn to him. Thanks so much for watching. If you enjoyed this video, please give it a like. And if you have any questions about Van Wagen's ideas, please leave a comment and I'll try to answer them in part two of this series. Also, please remember that there are way more details nuance, and arguments in Van Wagen's book than I can get into in a video like this. If you're interested in learning more about Van Wagen's ideas, be sure to check out the description because I've linked several of his videos and essays that are helpful in understanding his philosophy. Thanks again for watching, and God bless.